Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I just in press would like to thank you all for joining us this evening um, for the launch of Static. Um, this is all part of uh, UCT's Festival of Desire. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our MC for the evening, uh, Craig Sodi. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm not going to be the proper MC because I'm going to ask Adam to introduce the uh, uh, performers. Uh, I'm here to essentially introduce Adam and to speak to uh, uh, the, uh, the book itself. And so, all of you know Adam. And that's why you're here. And it's really great to see you all and, and to say that I think it's a marvelous tribute to Adam that uh, you've uh, come out uh, to be here with us this evening. Uh, this, incredibly, is Adam's second book. Uh, and uh, Adam, uh, I know, had a, a few anxious moments in putting this book together and it's really great Adam, to see it come to this point. Spoken to him as he was mulling over this and that about the book, about the final product, what it should look like. Uh, and uh, you could sense how much doing this meant for him. Now, I just want to spend a few moments telling you about how difficult it is to get a book published. Putting out a book for people like ourselves, <clears throat> academics like ourselves, is a, is a, is a big deal. <clears throat> it's a moment of, of triumph, essentially triumph over oneself, over this amazing self-doubt that accompanies uh, the work of very many academics. You'd be surprised how doubtful people feel about the things that they, they're doing. It's very much like a musician putting out an album. A musician putting out an album has to convince a recording company that there's something in his or her sound. Uh, and then the company wants to know that this album is going to, uh, going to sell. It's pretty much like that for an academic too, except it's a bit harder. It's harder because the hoops are so much more intense. You start off with by pitching an idea to uh, the publisher. Uh, and if the publisher likes it, you then have to write a proposal. Uh, and this proposal is then put in front of a, uh, the publisher's board. And if the publisher's board says, yes, go ahead, then you have to actually produce the darn thing. <laughs> and producing this darn thing is, uh, as many academics know, putting together a whole book is uh, an amazing achievement. But then the trouble starts. Because that book, that manuscript, which is not a book yet, has to be... Uh, subjected to what is called in the academic environment blind review. It's sent out to people whom you have no control over. Uh, they don't know you, you don't know them, and they're supposed to judge this thing only on its merits. Uh, and this process is uh, a, an absolutely cruel one. Uh, so if you're faint-hearted, it ain't for you. Because the way in which these uh, critics come back uh, is uh, intended to be as uh, helpful as they think they can be. Uh, and that help is, is often to tell you as it is. This is rubbish. You know, the way in which you're writing this is uh, really poor. Take this back and go and uh, rework it. Uh, and as I say, if you're a sensitive person, uh, uh, you often fail at this particular point. Uh, you lose heart. 
But Adam has stayed the course. And the book is now in print. And Adam has a second book in hand. Uh, it's a book that his blind reviewers, the experts, have said is a worthwhile book. And so it is. And as now his uh, third reviewer, I'd like to tell you why I think it is. Why it is a, a, a valuable book. It's a valuable book because it provides a much needed overview of our popular culture, our music and our art. It does this wonderful thing of introducing to an academic audience important artists and the kind of groundbreaking work uh, they are doing. Artists like Bernie was here this morning, EJ von Lyric Zups, the late Mr. Devious. It tells the story of their emergence and links them to global and local genres to which they've related. So just reading the book, just, just reading the book will give you a good sense of what this local cultural landscape uh, uh, looks like. You learn a lot. But it's the way Adam does this job, does this job of introducing these artists, contextualizing them. Uh, how he does it, I want to say to you, is absolutely crucial. He does so through what I think is the central value of the book. And that is to locate these artists in the circuits of power in which they find themselves. It's how this power works, Adam argues, that, that we are needing to understand. So let me try to explain to you how he helps us come to an understanding of this power. His opening move is to alert us to the fact that there's a lot of static around. The static, he says, is background noise. It makes it hard for us to hear uh, and understand what's actually going on. But static is also the electric charge, or an electric charge, which can shock one. In the static, he argues, we are needing to see how the shock, the shock of economic forces, the counter shock of agency, how all of these forces operate, how dominance continues to serve the interests of global capital, and how, as a shock in this particular case, the interests of a few big media monopolies, not the interests of the public, are being served. South Africa, Adam argues, in managing its transition from apartheid to post-apartheid, chose to, or was forced to, fall in line with the project of neoliberalism and its commercial and economic interests. And that's the big story that he tells. And you can conjugate that story in very simple kinds of ways. You can turn it into a kind of formula. What he does is to uh, show, and this is the value of this kind of work, how it works, how it works in music, how it works in art. It shows how much hip-hop is co-opted and being appropriated <coughs> by the big media houses. And I quote him, this is a recent example of such a strategy is S.A.B. Miller Castle, uh, sorry, is a S.A.B. Miller Castle Light commercial that features U.S. rap artist Vanilla Ice, performing his late 80s hit single, Ice, Ice Baby, close quotes. He shows, and here's what gets my very happy support, Adam, what kinds of strategies the big companies are using to play with the minds of young people. He shows how seductively these strategies are about affirming supposedly cool identities head-bumping identities, he says. Cool young black men without a care in the world who are complicit in the sexual ex exploitation of women and the abusive marginalization of gays and who critically reproduce narrow and utterly problematic stereotypes of subordinate people. He shows how the companies revel in these stereotypes and how ultimately these stereotypes come to affirm inequality, injustice, and the denial of dignity. And it is his analysis 
And this makes, I think, the book really uh, worthwhile. So Nadia Sanger was earlier talking about uh, the unworked. And what Adam does in the book is spend uh, two whole chapters on talking about uh, these new, what one might call, local rebels. He begins with Borg van Berg, and he goes on to uh, the unworked. And the way in which he works with these rebels, uh, these now uh, almost iconic rebels, is really important. So media phenomena that Van Gleb was, now the unworked are, it shows how deeply problematic uh, they are. Uh, it is his discussion of the unworked that makes it necessary for us to pay attention to what he's saying. He says, and I'm quoting him, the unworked uses mass media strategies to repackage apartheid era thinking on racial identity for post apartheid South Africans, international audiences, and expatriates. This, he argues, is contemporary blackface. With privileged people, self consciously white in this instance, pretend to be black, not out of a sense of respect and the desire to begin a dialogue black people, but to confirm for themselves their distance from these black people. In none of the unworth's work, he argues, is there any sense of disrupting the stereotype. And he tells this really important story, uh, and I didn't see it, of uh, the, the unworth being featured in a toppling uh, 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 episode. And how this episode plays out uh, with the uh, characters mimicking what it means to be uh, black and masculine and thuggish uh, and simply use the uh, township uh, of, um, um, sorry, did I say Manenberg? Mitchell's Plain. Sorry, I meant Mitchell's Plain. Hyde uses Mitchell's Plain and the township uh, simply as a set. It's a people who are uh, the people who are supposedly the uh, subjects which uh, uh, are supposed to have inspired um, the unworked are simply in the background, uh, have no role to play whatsoever uh, in, this, in this performance. And so his analysis of, of, of how uh, these images work and how these in images operate I think is, is, is really important. But he also shows how much these local artists um, are engaging with the conditions of domination. It shows how Bernie was infuriated uh, when Issa B. Miller used vanilla ice. And furious at vanilla ice himself. Uh, furious at how they were playing with the minds of uh, young people. And he shows how much people like Bernie come to challenge big capital. It's the value of this challenge that he shares. He shows, following this line of analysis, how this critical work comes into reality. Work which challenges the world of dominance and hegemony, work which challenges racism and sexism, and work which in the end struggles to get out. He tells the powerful story of the red card campaign which sought to expose the kind of big capital which had kept apartheid in place, and which was then instrumental in having Shakira come here and perform at the uh, uh, local uh, World Cup, without a single local artist uh, accompanying, uh, accompanying them. And how instead, the local artists at that time had to use their underground networks uh, to, to get their music out. He tells this uh, incredible story of these MCs from Secunda, Mtabisi, Inspector Mpofu, Mpumalelo, Pava, Gums, or Guns, how do you say? Guns. And Isaac Woody Hoodster, uh, Mongwato. And how they struggled to launch a song uh, which they did uh, on President Zuma. It's called My President Zapim. <laughs> So in telling the stories of these local artists, he uh, is paying homage to them. 
being respectful. He's showing how this economy uh, of the art world uh, operates. But in paying homage, he isn't uncritical. He shows how often the kind of critique one sees in the work of many artists. And yet he takes aim at people like Zapiro too and Brett Murray. Uh, he makes the comment that they actually don't get to engage the full complexity of social injustice and inequality. And how often the criticism that they're making produces these arguments which become red herrings. Because these arguments avoid the big issues. Uh, and so neoliberalism is let off the hook. And so in otherwise successful works such as that of Yuzo Hizo, uh, he shows how this work fails to disrupt uh, the association of blackness with violence, or as in much quieter, uh, how quieter attempts to liberate young people from the reproductive clutches of racism, yes, only to offer them up to the crudity of materialism and hedonism. And so I'm bringing this reflection to a close. I'd like to offer my congratulations again to Adam for writing a book that I think works at, uh, at many levels. A work that pays tribute to a group of powerful cultural producers sitting on the margins. And for demonstrating critically how race and racism work. It is this last point which I want to emphasize in closing. Adam begins the work by making the important point that race is a, is a social construction. But everybody's doing that today. Everybody is saying that race is a social construction, but never actually then engaging with what the social construction process uh, is all about. He does it. He shows, he demonstrates how social constructionism actually works. He shows how the identities of dominance and power uh, come into being and how these reproduce themselves uh, and instantiate themselves uh, into the everyday. And how these interpolate people of subordinate identities. And he shows all the contradictions around all of us. And that's what we're wanting to expect of work which invokes this concept of social constructionism uh, and puts it to work. So, Adam, you've done a really important piece of sociology here, so I doff my cap to you, say thank you to you. My big congratulations, and thank you for asking me to uh, speak here at your opening. Thanks. I'm actually speechless. I didn't expect such a thoughtful and critical engagement um, with my work, Jane. Um, yeah, I think, I think you... I think you've engaged with the work in, 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 in a way that, that I think more than does it justice. Um, and I'm beginning to think, is it too late to insert a foreword into that book, a second foreword, <laughs> maybe with the second edition, because that, you know, um, I'm glad that we recorded this so we can transcribe this discussion. Um, th there might be a way to actually sort of um, pay tribute to, to you know, to, 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 the, to, to your engagement in this context. So I'm glad that we are shooting this and it will be available. Um, I think the process of actually producing this work, um, it's, it's a nice metaphor, the book itself went through an identity crisis. It didn't know what it wanted to be. And a part of the problem was that I was unclear about what this awkward moment is that we find ourselves in. I couldn't process it. And every time I thought I had the story nailed down, I have a version of this story of youth culture, identity, and the transition, I've got it locked down. Something new happens. To give you an example, I'm minding my own business one day on the way to Kirsten Bosch taking a walk. Stephen Robbins of Anthropology at Stellenbosch stops his car. And all of a sudden he says, Adam, Stephen, how's it? Um, Anki Grok is doing a paper on Book van Blarik's Dalleray. I want you to be a respondent. And my first thought is, oh, hell no. I don't want to engage with that. It's too hard. It's going to make me too angry. 
So every time something happens and I get drawn in and my first reaction is an emotional reaction because I have really good colleagues, not just at this university, but in other places around the country, they're always keen to push me into awkward situations where I have to really think about why my emotional response to something is, is, is preventing me from engaging with this intellectually. So Dalla being a respondent to Aki Kroos, very, very, you know, very good paper at a Stalinbosch seminar, forced me to really think about what my problems, what my issue is with Dalla And the obvious answer is the striking absence of black people in the Dalla music video. I mean, the story of that war, the South African war, was some historians during the apartheid era called it the Anglo Boer War, which is a misnomer. The story is that everybody, black, colored, white subjects, were caught up in that war. And that gets erased in that music video. And this confirms a particular version of the apartheid education uh, into which many of us were socialized in the 70s and 80s, gutter education. So that is one other awkward moment. The second awkward moment, there are many awkward moments in the story of writing this book, um, was when I just got to Harvard on a fellowship in Feb 2010, and the unworth literally blew up to, to, to you know, quite hip hop speak. It blew up. So wherever I went in those five months around the States, you're from South Africa doing research in black youth culture, tell me about the unworth. So if you go, if you check out Vermeo, there's a Vermeo video of uh, this Harvard public, public lecture that I do. And uh, that's what happens. I'm talking about black youth culture, about what you know, a range of black subjects from the margins are doing with youth culture and how they're using art in ways that are quite meaningful. During question time, guess what happens? Tell us about the answer. I don't worry, we, uh, you know, this is the state's ban, but it's not an issue. Just go online to YouTube and show some videos and talk us through it. So, yet again, back to the drawing board, I have to tell that story. And I have to interrogate why I'm, my immediate emotional reaction is anger and, and work my way back from that to come up with some sort of intelligent response. So I think a lot of what you see coming to in this text cuts to the bone in a sense. This isn't some distanced objective exercise. This cuts to my experience as a person growing up on the Cape Flats and being located by very particular kinds of discourses, being located by very kinds of histories and geographies that actually limit agency for a wide range of people. And that's what I'm attempting to unpack. So for me, the way in which I processed these awkward moments in our country from Mshiniwam, the spear, to the Antwoord, to Dalare, um, was through Fanon. So what you will see coming through the, the text is a particular reading of Black Skin's White Masks, the story of racial interpolation, and our internalization of neo-colonial ideas on race and gender. And on the other hand, a particular interpretation of Nature of the Earth, a particular chapter in actual fact, the pitfalls of national consciousness. So the story of emerging black elite minorities being servants of capital. And, uh, resulting in the betrayal of uh, what one scholar calls, the, you know, the dream of Biko. It's not a dream deferred, it's a dream defiled. How that betrayal could happen. And I tend to tell that story through music, media, and film, through different moments, different media events. So that is the story. It's, a, it's an incredibly, I think, it's unresolved. It's, it's not conclusive, and I think that quite aptly reflects where we are right now. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable. And I hope this will provoke further discussion. It's not a definitive text at all. Um, yeah. But before, let me not go into that into too much detail. I think Crane has, has more than done this, this, this work justice. Um, there are some people I would like to thank before I introduce Jits Finger, I'll perform a quick introduction to Jits Finger. Um, I'd like to thank my family for their support, uh, putting up with endless hours of, of being distracted. Even when I'm physically present, you know, said individuals can tell that I'm, I'm not, not present in many respects. So thanks to Suraya, Razin, my mom, Fatima, specifically, Auntie Adla, um, Khadija, Nazli, my dad, Ryan, thanks. And um, my colleagues, not just UCD colleagues, but a broad range of people are able to engage with me and push me out of my comfort zone, 
when I started out, I was just going to be a hip-hop scholar. I was just going to be talking about hip-hop and rap. And what I ended up being pushed into doing is to look at music and look at different conversations across genres, across language groups, across geographies, to think about how people are engaging with each other across those boundaries, but also not engaging with each other, how they generate noise and are not listening to each other, um, which is where the title static comes from. So that was an important moment. Um, I'd like to thank specifically UCT as far as professional and legal guidance with this process, it's been difficult. And I'd like to thank the publisher for really standing by me and making this thing happen and seeing the opportunity in what is potentially a tricky publication. Um, I think the kind of interest that the work is already generating uh, among scholars and in the Mail and Guardian apparently, I haven't seen it, um, tells you that, that the gamble that you're taking is, is, is a good one. It's going to pay off. Lotta, ka -ching. So, <laughs> congratulations to everybody. My photographer, my personal photographer, Gary Stewart, who shows up only for book launches. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wouldn't be the same without you. My camera crew, um, excellent. I haven't had to worry about anybody. But more importantly, thanks to Alan Hurst and Crane Sodin, the key brains and drivers behind Festival of Desire, thanks for an awesome conference, but also just thanks for offering to host it in, in this very appropriate context. Um, thanks, thanks so much, much appreciated.